my lecture, you know, today, uh, I'm not going to be addressing um, the questions of labor and working class culture and collective action, um, which are probably the reasons that people thought to even consider inviting me. Although my research on French gastronomy was initially motivated, I think, by some of the same sentiments that motivate my interest in working class culture and the labor movement. Uh, psychoanalytically, perhaps, if not uh, socioanalytically, for I was intent early on with this research to pierce the bubble of bourgeois pretension, uh, uh, not of French bourgeois pretensions, but of uh, American bourgeois pretensions, for whom the bourgeois, for whom all things European and French in the cultural realm have always been objects of reverence, uh, cars and fashions and foods and even social theorists. My plan um, to lay this out to you is to present an analysis of a cultural field, French gastronomy in this case, which I've been working on for a very, very long time, kind of on the side. Um, only published a couple of things on it over the years, um, but I'm now trying to complete it in the coming months. And so being here and being able to do this has been great for me because it's, in a sense, allowed me to prepare a lecture that prods me toward completing it um, by tracing I'm going to, I want to trace the arc of the trajectory of the research for you, but it's sort of at the other end of it, at the end of the talk, the last, uh, I don't know, uh, section of it that I'm sort of laying out new for the first time for myself. Um, and, but generally, there's a focus here in, the, in what I'll present on three main intersections along my trajectory or route, three problematics in the recent history of this cultural field. The first is the introduction of American fast food into French cultural space. The second being the logic of the process um, by which traditional French uh, cuisine, French haute cuisine, ha uh, was transformed and has been transformed in this process, shaken up, if you will, and how this logic has been extended to the farthest reaches of the French cultural imagination, to le terroir, this term, that's kind of a mysterious term that's getting bandied about a lot in American culture now, but we'll talk about it in a few minutes. And la, la France profonde, the deep France, the, the kind of recesses of the French cultural imagination. I'm going to use PowerPoint today, um, uh, the, uh, at least PowerPoint images with no text, uh, to provide a visual backdrop of the agents and the institutions who inhabit this cultural domain that I want to tell you about. My interest in this material um, was driven really less by an interest in food and food ways than early on than it was by an interest in the social and economic effects of US cultural influence. Besides the fact that I was spending time there for family reasons on a regular basis, it seemed that no other society was in, as engaged in defending its cultural patrimony as aggressively as France uh, has for uh, gastronomy. In French, gastronomy has been among the crucial two or three pillars of the cultural patrimony. And this, for me, led initially to a study of fast food in France back in the 90s, um, where I was interested in understanding the introduction of this cultural practice and, and of this system um, among consumers, um, as well as as a system of production for employers and for their workers. Uh, in the research, I sought to demonstrate the distinctiveness of fast food in the realm of consumption practices, French consumption practices, uh, um, including um, the menu for sure, the food that, uh, uh, behind the counter, but also the atmosphere of restaurants, the uses of space, and these were uh, quite new in, in the 1980s when they were introduced. The uses of space, the, uh, the surface textures of the restaurants, the lighting levels. I took a photometer into McDonald's and fast food restaurants in France, but also traditional restaurants, and used that. And I have tables, and the first thing I wrote about this with looking at lighting meters, because I was really quite interested in the American presentation of a new form of cultural hyperbole, using lighting and color and, and I imagery. Um, uh, and also, um, the service innovations that these restaurants brought, the new kinds of self-service practices, 
um, a, new, a standard for queuing in restaurants, which at the time was quite new. Uh, new ways of eating, eating with one's hands, unwrapping food individually, was a, was a new phenomenon. And in fact, in the first McDonald's that I visited back in the late 80s by now, um, uh, in, in uh, southeastern France, there had been no other fast food restaurants. And at the first opening of the restaurant in a uh, town called NC, the, uh, uh, the restaurant, the McDonald's, had an interlocutor, and then someone at the door who would guide customers inside, show them where to stand, kind of explain the menu and how it works. That they, This was all for, fairly new in the French uh, social universe. Um, also, I was interested in understanding the, the customer base of these restaurants. I looked at, uh, using French marketing studies mostly, the social background of, of consumers, uh, jet by gender, by social occupation, by occupation, um, and also as an expression of cultural transgression by French youth. In the first decade or so of the, of the market, it was dominated by French young people. And I have a kind of an analysis of that that I'm not going to share now, but um, it has to do with a kind of form of cultural rebellion that Americanism represented to the French. Um, also, I was interested in the restaurant sites, literally the geography of the restaurants on French cultural space, the symbolic place of McDonald's um, on the French landscape, um, and also McDonald's as a real estate company, which has an enormous amount of capital to locate sites in the most traffic busy uh, intersections, uh, not only in Paris or in France, but in the, in the world. Um, uh, uh, with the distinctiveness of fast food, and this was my concern throughout these segments of this research, um, the distinctiveness of fast food in relation to traditional French, culture, uh, French restaurants. Also, in not only in the realm of consumption, but in the realm of uh, production practices, characterized by computerized counting, accounting systems, um, you know, accounting systems that allow McDonald's in Oak Brook, Illinois, to know the number of milkshakes sold in any outlet in any restaurant in Paris at any time of the day, um, the hyper-rationalization of food preparation, uh, which was something quite new in France to break the process down using this, um, what's the word? Um, uh, what sorts of the V, I can't think of the word. Um, uh, uh, it's a term from labor process literature. Anyway, um, uh, 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 the labor process is broken down into its simplest parts, thank you. Um, uh, the extensive use of contingent part-time labor in these restaurants, um, and a virulent anti-unionism uh, that McDonald's was bringing along, introducing it into the French service sector. These were consumption and production practices that were relatively new, and especially in the service sector and the restaurant industry. Um, though there were moments in which McDonald's was forced to adapt itself to French practices um, as well as this strike, a one and a half year old uh, 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 worker occupation of a McDonald's outlet uh, in Paris uh, demonstrated and was a symbol uh, for the years that it was being occupied. Um, by pulling at the threads of McDonald's in France, I soon found myself in a world of industrial processes and industrial organizations, a world propelled by the economic power of the Grand Groupe Agroalimentaire, the uh, large corporate uh, food processing sector which had developed in the 1970s and into the 1980s in France. These are corporate conglomerates with names like Accor and Sodexo and Nestle and Unilever, who are heavy investors in large, vertically uh, integrated food processing companies, in chain restaurants, in cafeterias, and in French fast food companies. These are organizations that model themselves after the McDonald's formula. These French fast food companies um, in the, hang on, I gotta, somehow, yeah, there it works. Um, uh, down in this segment, um, uh, hamburgers and fast food and McDonald's um, really at the time um, were almost secondary to the French fast food companies that were appearing um, fairly regularly in the, in the 1980s. Um, uh, but, the, but the McDonald's formula was modeled by French hamburger companies, particularly during about an eight-year period in which McDonald's was tied up in lawsuits on the French market, um, and they couldn't expand on the French market. They appeared in the 1970s, uh, but in fact, they were uh, pretty much uh, confined to 11 outlets in Paris, while the French firms were fighting them in court 
Um, and anyway, the, uh, McDonald's won the lawsuit, but it freed, in a sense, these, it gave an eight-year period in which French firms could model themselves after the American formula, set up hamburger restaurants um, throughout France with names like Quick and Free Time, and Kiss Burger, and Love Burger, and Katie's Burger. These were American sounding names um, that were perfect examples of what has been called organizational isomorphism. They were, had all the visual displays of American fast food restaurants with French fries and, and milkshakes and hamburgers and, and that. Um, however, the lawsuit ends in about 1982. Uh, I guess they were freed then to open their outlets on the market. And the French market for fast food is soon overwhelmed by McDonald's and its massive marketing budget and capital base, which allows it to secure the most expensive real estate sites for its outlets throughout Paris and France. And so while McDonald's um, started up, when it started up, it installed about 150 restaurants between 1982 and 1989. I'm sorry. Sorry about this. The right size, is it yeah. big enough for you? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so each of these golden arches represents 10 McDonald's outlets in the period from 1982 and 1989. When they fully wound up McDonald's and decided to expand into the French market in a, in a big way um, in 1989, they swept most of the French firms, uh, French hamburger firms from the market um, within just a few years, uh, installing one new McDonald's outlet every week for over a 20 year period. Um, so that uh, by 2009, uh, there were 1,200 McDonald's in France. Um, uh, again, each of the, uh, you can just see, I mean, they're everywhere. They're not only in Paris and, and Bordeaux and, and Lyon and Marseille, but they're also in, throughout the country in small regional cities of 30,000. Um, now, I might have stopped this research there, um, and I actually did for a couple of years. Um, I can, Figuring that I, had reason, that I had developed a reasonably good detailed case study of Americanization uh, and would have stopped and would have written a book that would have sound, been you know, a reasonably uh, uh, um, characteristic book um, from the kind of cultural studies perspective, focusing on both production and consumption, on design, and on all the things that say, I don't know, Dick Ebdige, uh, his book on... Uh, his article on Italian motor scooters in Italy in the post-war period, for me it was emblematic of the kind of cultural studies analysis that was interesting. Um, and that's what I sort of modeled this after at the time. Um, um, but then I encountered uh, Pierre Bourdieu, um, whose radical relationalism encouraged me to push beyond the boundary that I had set around my project, um, prompting me to reconstruct the focus and object of my analysis to try to encompass a broader field of relationships and mechanisms that linked mass culture to high culture, linked fast food to haute cuisine, and that linked the local to the regional, and linked Americanization, which was my initial kind of political project, to globaliz globalism more generally. Um, by field, uh, when I, uh, and that's what I had to do, is const construct, in a sense, a field, um, I mean a distinctive social microcosm that develops its own characteristic practices, rules, and forms of authority, standards of evaluation, distinct domains of human activity and practice that develop over time, that change, that sometimes wane, and that are more or less aut autonomous, that is, more or less able to insulate itself from the external influences and maintain its own criteria of evaluation, its own sort of integrity as, a, as an activity, against those of neighboring or intruding fields. The, this is sort of the generic framework that I used for analyzing cultural fields. The key axes are along on the, on the horizontal side are production practices, um, from the industrial to the artisanal. Um, the industrial being things that are, the, the value that is placed on practices that are short time, that are modern in technique, and that are highly standardized, as against the artisanal, 
take a long time, and that's valued, that value traditional technique, and that value unique, non-standard uh, practices. Uh, <clears throat> the consumption axis, axis vertically, um, are at the top restricted markets for luxury goods, characterized by, as we all know, sophistication and complexity of practice, formality, things that are high in expense, low in volume, and that are exclusive. As against the mass market at the bottom of goods that are produced for convenience and simplicity, informality, that are inexpensive, that are high volume production lines, and that are uh, inclusive, allow people accessible. Um, on, in, in most markets, in the, uh, the French market, um, the uh, American goods are represented at the lower right quadrant, and French goods tend to be represented to the world, and that's the French kind of representation of itself to the world in the realm of economic and cultural goods in the, in the upper uh, left uh, quadrant. In that initial phase of the research, that is studying fast food in France, I was, it turns out, only seeing a limited universe of practices and institutions that are reflected in this southeast quadrant of the diagram with fast food and its industrial relatives engaged in practices geared toward mass markets, high volume production, advanced industrial techniques, and where the U.S. is known for its leadership and mastery in this domain internationally. It is the obverse of haute cuisine as a cultural practice and traditional cultural representations of Frenchness. Traditionally, the world of haute cuisine was a world largely unto itself, operating as a relatively autonomous domain of culinary practices, its own rules and regulations, its own forms of authority, its own standards. Uh, and autonomy achieved largely, by the way, these, there was, a, in a sense, a firewall between these two worlds. When I began the project and interviewing fast food executives and, and uh, uh, food journalists in France, they wouldn't acknowledge that this new fast food phenomenon had anything to do with French, traditional French cuisine. It was a different universe. Um, and uh, over and over again, they said, uh, uh, um, when I would ask, well, what about the introduction of American kinds of food and ways of eating? They didn't want to acknowledge it as an introduction into France, really. It was an American thing that operated on the French market. Um, Just for yes. Does the arrangement of these word costs have any meaning in it? Is, like, are the, is the distance between them, is, are you doing anything like that with these, or is it just to, to create? I want to do something with okay. the distance between them, okay. based uh, upon volumes of capital that are deployed on each side. Um, I haven't done it yet. I this is my approximation it. as to where these things kind of ought to be. Um, uh, so this is quite a subjective kind of, this is sort of to help you see the relationships, but not the depth of the relationships, really. Okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> so um, I can't uh, kind of, I don't want to do the history of this developing field. Um, other historians and his historians have done that. Um, but it was an autonomy over t that was achieved over time, largely through a 19th century process of conquest, in which male professional chefs won their place at the center of an emerging gastronomic field against both the industrial practitioners of industrial cuisine and the specifically male artisans and specifically male artisans as distinct from the female purveyors of domestic cuisine. And there's a whole sort of, there is a literature on, uh, the, the, on this process. Um, there's also a, a, a literature on the industrial process itself. And there was, at, a, at the time, um, there were those who extolled the virtues, almost like you were reading a guidebook of, of fine cooking, the, um, the virtues of industrial practices in the realm of foodways, huh? the vats that were organized, the, the technologies um, with picture. I'm thinking of a book by Auguste Corte, Le Conserve Alimentaire, a really fascinating book for kind of reversing the kind of the cultural sort of attraction. Huh? Um, he was completely... Um, uh, what's the word, enthralled by industrial technique uh, for how to pack peas into a machine that would peel them. And, and, uh, and so the book is kind of a, uh, I mean, it's a, a book published in 1902, 1903, um, which is uh, um, filled with this sort of new, this ethos of industrial technique as an aesthetic on its own terms. This hierarchical social differentiation 
male, female, the role of the chefs versus women in the kitchen, um, um, of culinary practices, elevated both the grand chef and haute cuisine as a cultural object in France, was made possible by the development, and I want to, and this is where uh, Bourdieu's perspective has really helped me to figure out what needs to be understood in this process, um, the development of a system for the production and reproduction of belief in the virtuosity of the chef and the cultural meaning of haute cuisine. That is, none of that was self-evident. It had to be built from scratch, and organizations and critics and writers um, um, elevated this idea of um, cuisine to something grander th um, than its practice. Um, a collective system of food guides and trade journals and magazines and journalists and critics and museums, both established figures and rebels in this process of t the talk about food, becomes important for the elevation of it as something worthy of our commitment or the commitment of those who are inside it. While peripheral to the cooking process in the kitchen, these were central to the production of belief in both the power of the chef and the power of haute cuisine as a cultural object. But fields are not static, and over the course of the 1980s, the economic 70s and the 80s, the, really the 70s actually, the economic capital of the Grand Group Agro Alimentaire extended itself into what had been a relatively autonomous sector of culinary practices to purchase, in a sense, the symbolic capital of the Grand Chefs and the Grand, and the grand Restaurants of, of France. Um, when, I say purchase, when I say symbolic capital, I mean, in a sense, a capital of recognition that permits an actor, a social actor, a person or an institution, to in a sense exert a kind of magical power in a domain where this capital has been conferred. There's symbolic capital in all cultural domains in which you know, you, by virtue of who you are, you, there's a recognition that allows itself to exert its aura. Great professors are in examples in the, in the academic world. Um, this process of purchasing Symbolic capital. Um, it began, from as far as I can tell, as far as I can locate it, and I'm sure there may be other glimmers of this, um, in 1976, when the, 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 the grand chef, Michel Guerard, um, who was highly consecrated at the time, having gone through all of the kind of institutions of consecration that make a grand chef, um, and who was strongly associated with nouvelle cuisine, um, uh, technique that we could talk about later, but um, that signed a consulting contract with Nestle's, thereby allowing him to step over to the industrial side of this divide, um, which was viewed at the time as an act of heresy, and he was written about in the, in the culinary press as having committed an act of, you know, he was being attracted by lucre, uh, no longer the arts, um, um, but the uh, um, material goods. Um, it's in the same process, beginning in the 70s and early 80s, where industrial groups from the economic sector begin to purchase the most venerable of Parisian bistros, Le Balzar and La Coupole, two old uh, 19th century bistros. One was bought out by Group Flow, or both of them were bought out by uh, Group Flow, which is known for its chain of brasseries, um, and the Brasserie Leap, um, again, a venerable uh, uh, bistro on the Boulevard Saint-Germain, was bought out by Group Bernard, which also owns ten or owned ten quick fast food outlets at the time, a chain of cafeterias, um, and has its brasserie leap mark now internationally. It's uh, in many of the big capitals of Europe. At least there's a brasserie leap, or maybe two sometimes. Um, also, Maxime's Restaurant of Paris, now a chain of restaurants. All of these were bought out within the period of about a decade. Um, more and more. The, the traditional cultural firewall that separated haute cuisine and the grand chefs from industrial cuisine, cuisine was breached. As Disney hired Paul Bocuse uh, in the upper right uh, uh, um, to open a restaurant at Epcot Center, where he would later claim, having learned the business potential of publicity and expansion into the mass market from Disney's master chefs. That is, he learned self-promotion there, and he is the most well-known of self-promoting chefs, I think, now uh, in France. Um, frozen food processing companies began to purchase the names of chefs, including Michel Guerard, Bernard Loiseau in the lower right, um, and Paul Bocuse, to lines of gourmet frozen food under their signatures. 
Michel Oliver created a line of chain restaurants and developed a line of pre-cooked food for the cafeterias of a large supermarket chain. Alain Ducasse, um, in Night by, this is from 1990, Le Chef magazine, which is the most important organ of the chef profession, internal organ. Um, by 1990, the annual Chef of the Year um, was presented by this magazine uh, uh, to uh, uh, Alain Ducasse. Um, it turns out it was also the magazine itself, and this issue of the magazine was underwritten by six large food processing companies, including Nestle and Eurest. And in turn, Le Chef magazine began giving annual awards to the industrial food processing companies for the first time for their creations. So that in the same issue that Alain Ducasse, and this is the cover um, of Louis Quinze restaurant in Monte Carlo, which at the time was probably the most expensive restaurant in the world, received the, in the issue where he receives his Chef of the Year award, industrial food processing executives received awards in that issue for their industrial products. Uh, oh wait, oh wait, this is also Ducasse. Um, he went on to um, uh, own three three-star restaurants. It's unheard of in the French uh, universe. Um, three owning three. Most uh, chefs die to be considered uh, to own one, and uh, Ducasse is the first one to own this many. Um, uh, and it, he has a, a veritable empire of restaurants, of cooking schools, of consultant shifts, uh, consultant shifts. Um, but in the same issue, um, uh, the Darigal Company wins an award for frozen aromatic herbs, um, Mikogel Company for its frozen Bavarian desserts, uh, and Uncle Ben's for a prepackaged salad. Um, on the industrial side, the lower right quadrant again, it is, an, it is economic capital that holds sway, where companies are judged successful or not on the basis of their annual turnover, their chiffre des affaires, sales volume. Um, secondarily, and this is probably attributed to the persistent French uh, modesty, um, compensation of the top executives, which is not published as widely, or I don't think it's known as much as it is here. Here it's an object, everyone sort of knows how much you know, the leaders of some of the richest corporations are paid, and I think that's less well known. But it's known within the world of gastronomy in France. On the side of haute cuisine, it is cultural and symbolic capital that holds sway, with the grand chefs as symbolic capital personified. Chefs represent the key actors in this universe because in restricted cultural markets, it's not so much the rarity of the product, but the rarity of the producer that bestows value on the object, on the cultural object. In the domain of haute cuisine, one is anointed a grand chef by various rituals of consecration, the most important being receipt of a three-star three rating in the Michelin Guide, an honor bestowed on no more than usually 20 to 25 restaurant chef owners in France at any given time, and that represents the highest form of recognition that a chef can receive, elevating them to the apex of French cultural life and, uh, and cultural power. This is, uh, 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 and these chefs become almost household names in France when they win their third star. I mean, most French families, middle class families, um, have, a, have a Michelin guide in their glove compartment. It's what you have in your glove compartment because it tells you where you can stay where you, when you're traveling. Um, it, it rates hotels and it also rates uh, restaurants, not only the, the most consecrated, but even just regular the local restaurants. It's quite varied, in fact. Um, but it's well known, and, the, and so, some of you may know that when the three star is announced every year, right around this time actually, early in March, um, it's major uh, talk in the newspapers, it's on the television news, um, it's, you know, I don't know what it's akin to, you know, I think of um, Americans have a kind of preoccupation almost with, um, with uh, billionaires, you know, or with sports stars, huh? it's the same kind of thing, they become sort of household names and you know sort of about them. Um, here is um, Bocuse with President Giscard d'Estaing and uh, François Mitterrand. Um, um, there I am, um, uh, getting my hands dirty in field work, um, with uh, uh, Georges Blanc. Um, uh, um, I can't tell you what it was like to try to get the controller of Smith College to um, uh, reimburse me. <laughs> Wait a minute, this meal? Um, which caused hundreds and I don't know, 
can't remember what it was now, $300, you know? I just wanted my side of the, ma of the, of the, of the check. Um, and the emails back and forth, which I didn't, I don't know if I still have them, but they're really quite hysterical. Um, uh, <laughs> trying to convince him that my bill for the meal, um, uh, uh, my bill for a meal that included crêpes parmentières au saumon et caviar avec beurre léger au zeste de citron should be reimbursed not as the meal while doing research, but as research itself. Um, uh, it was really quite funny. Um, anyway, um, uh, it isn't only about, uh, it isn't only the Michelin Guide that confers symbolic capital in this world, but an elaborate edifice of foundations and councils, um, competitions, the Meilleure Ouvrière de France, which is a, given out to the, uh, the best craftsmen in France across all domains, hairdressers, carpenters, and chefs um, are eligible to compete for this award which gives the winner um, nothing more than the French tricolore ribbon to hang around. It is completely symbolic, it's a complete honor, and it is much more important to many chefs in, in symbolic terms than even three stars in the, in the Michelin Guide because it says that you are, have achieved the height of artisanal uh, position in, in, your, in your craft. Um, it goes back 150 years, these, these awards. Um, uh, magazines and restaurant guides and festivals are all part of the mix of the consecration of the chef. Why? What does it do? It sustains the sacred power of haute cuisine, along with an army of journalists and critics and various rites of consecration, um, including award ceremonies like the Confrérie des Chevaliers du Taste de Vin, an exclusive dinner um, uh, every year for 600 held at the Chateau clos in Burgundy, a lot of pomp and circumstance, um, but it isn't a purely symbolic enterprise because it's now scheduled to precede the annual Burgundy wine market where uh, exporters and importers, distributors, restaurant sommeliers from around the world come to place their annual orders for Burgundy wine. And so a traditional uh, Renaissance ritual um, increasingly has served as the sacred face of a thoroughly modern commercial transaction. Obviously, I'm dealing here with this boundary between the two and find that, in effect, there's this adaptation and appropriation going on. Oh, Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. This is new. I just bought this. Um, I didn't want to have to be leaning over to that. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, um, in, this, in its own domain, haute cuisine appears old and venerable and traditional. That's its representation. But for the past 40 years, it has gradually become a site where symbolic capital is converted into economic capital. And once a chef is anointed by the appropriate institutions of consecration, his name is Midas-like, suddenly granted the power to turn his accumulated symbolic capital into economic gold. And it has been remarkable how the rhetoric of these grand chefs has seemed to shift once they have achieved their third Michelin star. From a dis discourse of excellence and exclusivity to one of democracy and accessibility. From, quote, no expense should be spared to secure the absolutely finest ingredients possible, and this is Alain Ducasse, to, quote, everyone must be given the opportunity to experience the wondrous creations of our kitchens. No kidding. Um, <laughs> um, it makes good sense to appeal now to the language of the, of the, of the mass market. Uh, Joel Robuchon, working to put at the disposal of consumers products of a superior level with reasonable prices is a very enriching experience, he finds. Um, like a religious epiphany, those who've spent their careers exalting the sacred are converted to the religion of the marketplace and find ways to accommodate themselves to the profane suddenly. Um, this image from the 1999 cover of the trade magazine of uh, uh, L'Hotellerie um, seemed to signal, um, at least to me in a, in a very public way, that the breakdown of the traditional barrier between industrial cuisine and haute cuisine was being now openly acknowledged within the field of gastronomy. It shows Pierre Ballon, the CEO of Sodexo Corporation, uh, it's the giant uh, second or third largest um, second or third to, to like Walmart in the, on the planet right now. Um, uh, with Claude Terrail on the right, um, a well-known, long-time owner 
uh, of La Tour d'Argent restaurant, which had been, has been among the most venerated restaurants in France. Um, it reads, quote, journey of two men animated by the same passion, restaurants. Um, before, I would argue, before the mid-1970s, they would not have acknowledged occupying the same cultural universe at all. By now, most of the celebrated chefs have inexpensive bistros and restaurants that cater to a wider market than their three-star restaurants that brought them their fame and position. Many have sold their symbolic capital in the form of their signatures and endorsements as consultants and advisors to food processing companies, supermarket chains, kitchen appliance companies, and have made fortunes on royalties and product endorsements. Um, Paul Bocuse took his three-star rating and his coveted title of Meilleur Ouvrier de France, um, 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 and um, uh, 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 translated it, or turned it, uh, converted it, um, into many millions of euros endorsing wines and candy and pots and pans and tableware and aprons and cookbooks. He's opened restaurants in Tokyo and Orlando, a cooking show, uh, CDs, um, it, it goes on and on and on. He's a corporate sort of symbol now. Um, in 2003, Revenue had his three-star restaurant in Lyon was about 6 million euros, um, which, which was about $7.4 million at the time, while Revenue at his three brasseries mass market uh, restaurants was 22 million euros. He now owns two more of those and runs Bocuse d'Or, which is an international competition um, of the, uh, the industrial food side. It's like an, exposition, an annual exposition of the industrial food uh, groups um, that his son Jérôme has now become the president of uh, in the last six months or so, year or so. Um, not only money is at stake, but celebrity. The, U, uh, the U.S. being um, the biggest stage that they can sort of uh, play upon. Um, after Bernard Loiseau um, uh, uh, won his th third Michelin star in 1990. Bernard Loiseau, by the way, um, hang on, uh, is here. Um, he wrote, uh, in 1991, he won his third, third Michelin star, then was able to write a best-selling cookbook and wrote seven or eight over the course of the years after, was offered a weekly newspaper column, and a restaurant in Tokyo was given a line of signature soups by Unilever. Um, again, that was the largest food company at the time in 1991, where he became a consultant. And Unilever then began to invest money in promoting Bernard Loiseau, sponsoring press junkets to his three-star La Côte d'Or restaurant outside of Paris uh, to taste his soups, for example. Loiseau eventually opened three mass market bistros in Paris to trade on his name. By 1997, his enterprise was listed on the Paris Stock Exchange, the Paris Bourse. By the time Bernard Loiseau committed suicide, I forgot about that, um, in 2003, with this hunting rifle, by the way, um, by the, uh, he was the most widely recognized chef in France. Some 90% of the population claimed to know his name when polled. Um, but the pressure of maintaining both sides of this structure, the artisanal and the industrial, he was holding up was evidently more than um, he could bear. Um, but most of the celebrated chefs now have signed contracts with industrial groups or have opened less expensive bistros. Maybe one or two of the 25 that, or I have like 37 in my kind of dossiers on my database, um, maybe three of the 37 um, are not known for these or other activities. Um, um, but they're known for that, and they attract attention on the basis of resisting that, by the way. Um, uh, uh, most have inexpensive restaurants right next to their very expensive three-star restaurant. Um, uh, um, okay, I'm going to try to just jump ahead a little. Um, um, the fact that they own these inexpensive restaurants next door is not a bad thing in itself. Um, for those who've stayed in their restaurants to serve only those who can afford expensive meals, those few, um, it's a difficult financial struggle, for sure. Restaurants have uh, to be remodeled to three-star quality, um, require you know, about a million euro of investment, um, means that the grand chef has to maintain a close relationship to his banker. I say his because... Um, there is one woman, um, uh, only one woman of the, of the current kind of crop, um, 
uh, and um, she comes from a long line of chefs that the uh, restaurant had been established for about 50 or 100 years, 50 or 75 years. Um, uh, the French state only recently lowered the TVA charge on restaurant meals down to 5% from about 19% um, in recognition of the economic troubles on, in the restaurant industry and pressure from the industry. Um, but as long as go, ago as the mid-90s, at Bernard Loiseau's three-star restaurant, his signature dish, frog's legs with garlic and parsley puree, um, was 300 francs at the time, which is about $50. Um, um, but he claimed that this dish yielded a profit of only 10 francs, thereby justifying, he argued, his other activities. Um, the problem is that the symbolic aura of haute cuisine can be eroded by too close an embrace of industry. So a lot of what I'm talking about is not sort of widely sort of discussed, um, not widely known in the cultural domain in France. It is known among all the chefs, and it's talked about in, in the trade magazines. But in a sense, this is a, a still, to some degree, a hidden edifice. As the shift to industrial commercial activity, um, the question becomes, has it reduced the quality of food on the plate at three-star restaurants? For me, this has not been really the issue. I'm not as interested in the food as I am in the transformation of a cultural field. But in any event, there's no culinary guide or food critic able to judge this edifice from a neutral or objective standpoint. Everyone's involved. Everyone has a stake in the game, since they're all implicated in the collective construction of the value of haute cuisine as an activity. They all have a stake in this game, whether the established whether they're established voices or rebels, all are drawn into the vortex of belief in French gastronomy simply by being involved in, its, in the discourse of it. So it's hard to know with certainty how the food quality has been affected. But while we can't objectively judge a cultural object whose value is maintained by the judges themselves, we do know that the amount of time that these chefs actually spend at their craft has been reduced. They have become businessmen. They can't spend times the same kind of time in their kitchen. And some, that's been a, a serious problem. They've gotten a lot of attention from within the field for spending too much time away from the kitchen. Um, it's attracted attention by the food critics and criticism, such as that offered to Bernard Loiseau by the director of the Michelin Guide um, uh, not long before he committed suicide. Um, contrary to popular belief, he never lost his third star. That was good, spinning around. That's not why he committed suicide. But he was warned about the amount of time he was spending away from the kitchen and that he should devote more of his time to that because of his business activities. Time, in a sense, is the lead motif, lead motif of all artisanal production. Time to cultivate relationships with food suppliers, time to innovate, time to teach well the skills to secondary chefs and apprentices in the kitchen and around the stove. Um, what I'm essentially outlining here in this process, and I'm not quite done yet, um, are people hanging in there? Okay, I have, a, I have one more section to push through. What I'm essentially outlining here is the erosion of the autonomy of the gastronomic field, the weakening of its capacity to insulate itself from external influence, and to maintain its own criteria of evaluation over and against those of the economic field. It's not unusual for cultural fields um, uh, to be engaged in a comparable pressure. One thinks of cinema, for example, academia, for example, athletics, literature, art, all have been engaged in a comparable struggle to kind of hold off the criterion of evaluation from the economic field, if not the political field in some cases. Um, and the erosion is not at all uh, complete within the gastronomic field itself. There are, that is, there are mechanisms of internal reproduction that still insulate it from complete kind of, of uh, becoming completely prone to the economic field. There's a cult of lineage within the, within, among the chefs in which, you know, this chef, uh, Chef Verger begat uh, Chef Ducasse, who begat uh, Chef Soliver, um, that is, there's a whole sort of discourse about who worked with whom, as we know from academia. That's, in a sense, a comparable process, in which, which maintains a kind of integrity of the internal logic of the process um, over the course of generations. Um, uh, um, and there's virtually, it turns out, n virtually no career movement. Uh, I don't have that on the, on the board, but when you look at the two domains, huh, um, there's almost no career movement into haute cuisine from the east, from the southeast. There's almost no migration. That is, once you're in the lower right, uh, you're stuck there pretty much. 
you're pretty much there. It's comparable, let me just say, in academia, to uh, being an instructor at a community college after you finished your PhD, wanting to get to a large research university. The odds are you're marked. You're not going to make your way. I'm, I apologize for making that analogy, but I think there's, there's, some, uh, uh, there's something comparable there. Um, but the interpenetration of the artisanal and the industrial, whereby sy symbolic consecration by the former allows access to the economic capital of the latter, is a precarious arrangement, because the symbolic aura of haute cuisine can be destroyed entirely. The whole edifice can collapse with too obvious an association with the economic domain. Um, um, moreover, a similar relationship prevails in the lower left quadrant, where I haven't spent any time, where the, le terroir has been constructed as a symbolic representation and promotion of, quote, the local and the natural, by a process of what I would regard as artificial insemination of the, industri of the industries of agroalimentaire, tourism, and the systematic commercial promotion of industrial products as expressions of local heritage. Um, this, in a sense, third intersection in my arc um, um, was promoted. That is the reason I even went in this area to, to look at that lower left quadrant, which are not the dominant, that's not the dominant story. Um, but it was this, those frog's legs, for example, at Bernard Loiseau's restaurant that persuaded me that there was something interesting um, and that should be added to my analysis about the impact of French agriculture and rural life. Because I learned that the draining of marshlands in France had been the reason why frog's legs were being imported from Texas and Eastern Europe, Poland, and Cuba, uh, making the dish much more expensive. It prompted me to sort of begin to ask questions about changes in French agriculture and rural life and how they, the effect that they've had on French gastronomy. Just briefly, because the, the story is quite fascinating, I think, but I, I, enough already. Um, partly because of the centrality of gastronomy in French culture. A food processing industry itself developed very late in France. Farmers' cooperatives that had been formed at the beginning of the 20th century expanded tenfold in the 1970s. This is a truncated history. Especially in terms of food processing and marketing. That is the same year. The 1970s become critical for these, both of these domains. In response to the large numbers of American multinational firms entering France in the 1960s, that were taking advantage of this vacuum. That is the fact that there was no industrial food processing um, for the most part. Using um, uh, the European Economic Commission largely as a foothold into France. So for example, under this sort of uh, process, <coughs> Libby set up a tomato canning plant near Nîmes, putting local growers under contract. <coughs> Ralston Purina opened a chicken slaughterhouse <coughs> near Rennes and signed contracts with local uh, uh, poultry farmers. In response to pressure from the left, the state intervened, tacitly promising farmers that they would limit investment, American investment if the farmers would develop their own processing systems. And that led to various forms of partnership between cooperatives and corporations, and, and, and huge gains, actually, in productivity from about the 1970s onward. So that France, by the 1980s, um, became um, among the largest exporters um, uh, of food and also led to, and this is what's significant for me, the enactment of a kind of new strategy for rural development of France that was linked to le terroir um, and the exploitation of the gastronomic field um, that stabilized and reversed, by the way, decades of rural population decline in France, which is a long history in, um, uh, in French history, um, the, de the decline of, of, of the village. Le terroir. Uh, the French have always had a strong regional um, consciousness, which was only framed in gastronomic terms in the 1920s and 30s by these two characters, Karnansky and Roof. Karnansky is, is a pseudonym, um, who famously toured the country uh, over several years, publishing a series of 28 guidebooks to regional cuisines. They can be seen as laying the cultural groundwork for this idea, le terroir which is a word that has no real English, English equivalent. It's used to refer to that which is drawn from the earth, that is a particular earth or place, and made sublime by human artistry and, tra and traditional technique, all in the same practice. A distinctive place and its fruits, 
cultivated by traditional local methods, and also sanctified by the state in the form of the Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée, AOC, as you may see on a, on a decent bottle of wine, for example, a legal procedure instituted in 1905 to, one, delimit the precise regional territorial origin of products, to set the rules for their fabrication, and to specify the qualities, taste, and color, and texture of the final product. The AOC governs production of some 400 wines and waters, over 300 cheeses, and a range of other products, poultry from Bresse, lentils from Le Puy, grapes from Moisac, throughout the country, huh? augmented by other lesser forms of state consecration and protection. There's probably six or seven other labels that are attached, that can be attached to a, to a product to consecrate it um, uh, in, in various ways, but it's the AOC that is the most significant. Gastronomic museums have proliferated in France not since the 1905, but since the 1970s, um, led by regional coalitions of syndicats d'initiative, basically cha local chambers of commerce, farmers groups, and industrial food interests. There's a museum de, ch de champignons, de ch mushrooms, musée de chocolat, um, de cognac. Um, far from uh, th these are not representing primordial markers. Uh, um, of local tradition as they tried to represent themselves, but most of these museums were f founded after 1970 as a way to attract tourists and promote regional products to open the regional markets. Huh? <coughs> 77 of the 82 uh, of these museums that I found in this uh, compendium of these museums were established after 1970, um, for example. Among other things, the consciousness of le terroir has raised up the image of the mythical French peasant whose image was debased for centuries. It was a negative thing, um, and which has become increasingly idealized as the symbolic influence of, I would say, José Beauvais, you know, the guy who overthrew the McDonald's restaurant in the south of France about 19, I don't know, 99 or late 90s, I guess, um, uh, uh, um, and his Confédération Paysan, which has become an important sort of representation of peasant, uh, of peasant advocacy, which it had not been before. Um, as one analyst has written, the image of country people deprecated for so long has been completely reversed and has gradually gained in nostalgia as rural dwellers have left the countryside for urban centers. In this manner, peasant life has become the sanctuary of people's origins, their, their lost roots, and the source of an improbable authenticity. Um, uh, other analysts have characterized the country as being, quote, more of a landscape than a place of production. Stage management comes before productive function in the general public eye. That's by uh, Hervue and Viard, 1996. The other is Be uh, Bessier. In fact, gastronomy has played a central role in rural development over three decades, leading to a population revival in, an, in, a, in French rural life, which had been declining in population for probably 70 years. Urban dwellers who buy buying second homes in the villages of their origin, but also rural in migration, um, through two main strategies of development: investment in the gastronomic patrimony through the mobilization of institutions to construct tradition um, of local gastronomy to to invent tradition, uh, like the gastronomic museums, in the Plateau d'Aubrac, for example, in south central France, the AOC was achieved. Validating a local cheese, Laguiole, the, the red label, another, another consecration, was attached to the local cows. So you now have Bœuf Fermier au Brac, with the, uh, which are in all the restaurants and the butcher shops. After a long campaign of lobbying and maneuvering, not by the cows, um, the Appalachian Montagne recognized the fleur au Brac, a flower from the region, as being uh, sanctified by this you know, the, uh, the mountain um, uh, label. Um, and a traditional local dish, Aubrac Aligo, was also promoted. This is Aligo. Um, this is at a local fête Aligo that was blessed by uh, Michel Bras, who's a very famous three-star chef who happens to have his restaurant in, 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 in nearby, in Aubrac, and who's endorsed a frozen version of this uh, uh, dish, this dish is basically potatoes and cheese and garlic. It's incredibly delicious, um, but it's, I mean, it's, it, they, you get a big bowl of this and you have to kind of struggle with it because it's, but it's, it's really quite special. 
Um, and, but Michel Brun worked with others to imprint through publicity and marketing an imagery of rustic authenticity through traditional recipes and foods of his region. The other strategy of rural revival has been in industrial development, where local in, in, through investment in local infrastructure to produce and market traditional local foods for an international marketplace. This has been the case, for example, with Roquefort cheese, where the industry of agroalimentaire inserted itself into the traditional artisanal production by purchasing the traditional, the old caves of Roquefort, which is where the, these were, these are, I don't know, limestone caves where Roquefort was, was uh, kept uh, um, while it was being aged and, and, and processed or treated. I don't want to use the word processed. This sustained the, um, the surrounding uh, villages by industrial production um, of Roquefort, so that by 1975, the Aveyron region was able to support a higher percentage of farmers than elsewhere in France, and maintained farms and schools and populations, unlike many other rural communities. It became uh, France's large leading producer of sheep also, because ewe's milk is um, used for Roquefort, and lambs then became a secondary commodity for, for export. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a complicated story, the exploitation of local foods and methods, but it's now linked to vertically integrated industrial models governed by the imperatives of competition, of productivity, of the intensification of production techniques, as well as rural population revival, which is not a bad thing, but it's, it's part of the process. While the material, I'm going to finish it very soon, while the material and mental infrastructure, uh, and, uh, industrial infrastructure, remains largely concealed behind a symbolic facade of artisanship, tradition, and le terroir, enhanced by the in an industry of gastronomic tourism. Uh, the chefs, have or some in the industry, have called it a, basically a French Disneyland. You go and you take these tours, and then you go eat at a local restaurant, depending upon the level of the tour. If you're a rich tourist, you get to go to a three-star restaurant. If you're not, you go to one of these other establishments. Um, and in his study of Camembert, Pierre Boissard, um, vividly describes what happens when industry overtakes the art of cheese making. He writes, industrial fabrication begins by eradicating the original characteristics of the principal raw material, especially its inner life, its local and temporal qualities. In other words, anything that might recall the odor of the cow. The bacteria added to the milk to replace those killed by pasteurization are also closely monitored by industrial products. None are allowed into the factory unless their identities have been fixed and normalized. The industry creates a break in milk's spontaneous cycle of change in order to inject its own norms. In this respect, every stage of the process is subject to industrial discipline. The creation of camembert is no different than that of other industrial products. 90% of, of, of camembert is now industrially manufactured in France, and Michel Besnier, which is now actually his son, own the Lactalis Group, which own, has 40% of the world market for Camembert, including the, president, uh, the, the brand President, which you can find at uh, in supermarkets in Northampton, Massachusetts, but maybe not in Wisconsin. Yeah. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, raw milk cheeses considered far superior to, are considered far superior to pasteurized cheeses for retaining taste of the land, le terroir, of the grasses and herbs in the pasture. Only 18% of cheese production in France has remained in this um, mode um, and is under a sustained assault from the forces of industrial production via the EU and American lobbying efforts that are trying to forbid raw milk under the banner of free trade. Meanwhile, the terroir has become the central marketing device of industrial cuisine. From supermarkets promoting regional um, but an industrially produced food, that's a supermarket handout, in a supermarket in France, uh, you could get it anywhere, focusing on the local goods like we have here uh, and anywhere else. Um, uh, to McDonald's, uh, promoting local cheese, but also to McDonald's, um, that's a label that tells people in France that something it has, a, has a deep tradition in France and that they should sort of market it on that. It's become the important marketing device in the industrial sector, that is within supermarkets and industrially manufactured goods. Um, but also McDonald's now presents this when you go to a, this is, was uh, uh, from France, um, there, when, when I first got this a few years ago, you'd walk into a McDonald's restaurant in France and there'd be a, 
not a billboard, but a large poster um, kind of hitting you when you walked in. Um, to, so people wouldn't miss the idea that this is, this is food grown regionally and locally. Um, and it is, to a large degree, industrially, but locally. The obvious paradox is that the appeal of Le Terroir in France has been as a refuge from the forces of standardization and homogenization. That's the issue here. Um, uh, uh, the EU and the American economic model um, um, are bringing with them um, uh, into Le Terroir uh, this, this set of practices and this set of beliefs. Neoliberalism insinuates itself gradually over time by individual decisions to step over the firewall. And that's what I'm sort of tracing in this work, these decisions that are made um, on the basis of volume and certain forms of value as against traditional forms of value. While the infrastructure of Le Terroir has been maintained, if not produced, by the very institutions of standardization and homogenization, that is the industries of agroalimentaire made in America, no matter their national origin, um, from the standpoint of industrial co um, uh, corporations, on some level, it's heads I win, tails, uh, uh, tails you lose. Um, and that's the expression that I think of when I sort of look at the arrangement that they've constructed to, in a sense, um, a profit off both the local and the global. Um, um, but just as the relations of interpenetration between the grand chefs of haute cuisine and the chef d'entreprise, the business heads of the industrial cuisine, must remain concealed to sustain the system of exchange that supports this entire edifice, the myth of the natural, of the authentic, and the local, the terroir, must conceal an industrial infrastructure that sustains it uh, on its own behalf. Thank you for listening. Sorry, I've done so long. <laughs> would you put the uh, sort of classic neighborhood bakery for back okay. baguettes in the lower left? Because it's certainly inclusive and it's available everywhere, but it's a classic one. It's still artisanal. It's still artisanal, but it's been, there's, it's under, pressure, it's under right? some pressure, yeah? But, uh, I mean, remarkably robust given that pressure. Right? Sure. But it, it would right. be in that lower left-hand corner. Sure. I, I mean, I would think to put it there. Yes. Did you, do you know Daniel Berto's piece about the post-World War II struggle between uh, uh, over the baguette? Was that in The New Yorker? No, this, that is where like a, this is like a 20-year-old, 25-year-old. Oh, 25 then I don't. He has a story about how after World War II, uh, industrial um, flour makers in France tried to market American-style supermarket bread. And the, there was a mobilization by by bakers bakers to promote the baguette, and the, the industrial strategy was to basically initially try to say bread was bad for you. Maybe people should buy crackers because crackers were industrially made, uh -huh. uh, and the baguette became a kind of cracker bread because of its crustiness. So they, according to Daniel Berthold, I mean defined in that way, right, right. Uh -huh. So so the the Bakeries <laughs> right. back successfully. That's pretty early, yeah. Yeah. Very high. Me? Sure. Yeah. So um, you've laid out this really great story about the transformation of the culinary field in France, and I was hoping to hear more from you about um, what, I guess, what sort of What's sort of surprising or unexpected about this? Because I mean, I think like if I'm thinking about sort of what's driving this, I mean, you could very easily fit, based on what you told us, fit the story into some just basic sort of vulgar globalization thesis about the globalization of society and what have you. Um, and you know, I'm just wondering. So, so is there like, so for example, like was. Could you tell tell a bit more about? Uh, presumably, there there's been a lot of contestation in the upper right corner about you know, upper right, you, which uh, I mean the upper, upper left, left corner, yeah. sorry, mm -hmm. um, you know, sure. the haute cuisine and, and I mean so so in terms of the transformation of the field, obviously it's not just this automatic process, and, and and I'd I'd like to hear more about sort of the mm -hmm. the contestation because all the all the major figures you've talked about are people who have you know done this crossover and, and it just makes it sound seems smooth. Yeah. Yes, no, I mean, but you wouldn't have wanted me to 
present more, right? I mean, um, no, there's lots of, there are thousands of little stories about the introduction of new, of new techniques, the, the process of when Michel Guerin decides to go and sort of and sell his soul from some perspectives um, uh, to well, I guess how do you get from that in the 70s to just that's the thing that you do? I mean, I guess that well, I mean, it's a gradual process of making decisions based upon market pressure, um, the importance of, you know, uh, um, on some level, the, uh, the rise in the symbolic value of the upper left-hand corner um, creates the need on some level to, for economic support. And so in every decision that they make, it, you have to break new ground in a way. There's nothing established for those in the upper left to cash in. Um, you know, there's no infrastructure for that until it opens up. And it opens up on some level like a floodgate, but it's under the surface. So when food critics begin to hear, I mean, um, uh, it becomes part of how they evaluate chefs early on, right, in the 1970s and 1980s that so-and-so is working for this, so therefore there, it raises questions about it. Um, so that's the struggle. This is not a mass struggle. That's, you know, this is not a kind of struggle of collective action over, you know, over food. This is within this domain um, a new kind of set of valuations, which are, it's, I don't think it's only a, a matter of globalization entirely because um, it's about the link between the global and this local as not being kind of distinctive domains, but that are being intricately tied to one another. They are interpenetrated in ways that I think much of the logic of and discourse about globalization sort of misses to a large degree. And I think some of us, we miss it. You know, when we talk about the importance of the local, um, we sort of miss out on some of the institutional relationships that the so-called local have to these large uh, systems of, of economic development. So. Um, so that's why I think of it as different from uh, the typical globalization um, story. Also, um, I want to retain some element of the importance in the globalization part of the story, um, the power of the United States, the power of uh, Amer American power as a symbolic power, not necessarily just as a military or economic power, but also as a cultural power to kind of construct a, a new kind of um, outlet for French tradition. Uh, and um, it's why I made um, brief reference to you know French youth um, drawn to American styles, American goods, American cultural goods of all kinds, because it represented it a kind of form of um, rebellion against traditional cultural pra French cultural practices, um, uh, and that's a complicated story of its own. But it's true, I think, internationally. You know, uh, America furnishes this kind of cultural language uh, for youth. Um, under the guise of liberation, what you get with it also is this uh, corporate uh, set of practices. Um, why? Because the United States plays a role in the, in the economic world. It's able to set the rules. It sets the rules for international cooperation and for um, economic practice internationally. Um, so we set the terms for free trade. Um, anyway, um, Fantastic talk. I want to ask you a question directly on that last point that you made, and it's really a question about food and nationalism. And I, yes. uh, at the beginning of the talk, um, mm -hmm. you talked about uh, France's aggressive defense of its cultural patrimony, and yeah. the flags on your um, on your diagram here sort of right. are indicative of the way that nationalism could be used as a weapon to mm -hmm. defend the the status and prestige of that upper left hand mm -hmm. corner against um, against the uh, colonization by the mm -hmm. uh, logic of economic rationalism from the mm -hmm. lower right. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it seems to me that this, the story that you told makes it uh, the two ways in which it's increasingly difficult to do that. Because one, uh, the, the first part of your story is about how that, that upper left-hand corner is, in a sense, becoming Americanized as those, those ties uh, to the lower right uh, develop. And then the second part of your story is about uh, the use of sort of local and Regional identities as a marketing device. That's a kind of subnational kind of uh, mm -hmm. presentation. So, but in both ways, it mm -hmm. seems that it makes it difficult for uh, certain kinds of producers within this field to mobilize uh, a language or a discourse of French nationalism 
to defend their position within the field and to, to defend uh, their, their status within the field. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's... I think that's, that's true. Happened. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. I think it because in a sense it takes away some of the traditional sort of means by which a case could be mounted by French farmers against the EU back in the, you know, where they would dump wine or, or milk. Um, it becomes more difficult now um, when uh, your, your um, um, agricultural production is based on uh, Danon buying that, those goods to transform it into, uh, uh, you know, um, industrially produced local cheeses, you know. Um, and I, but I don't think, I think the idea that the upper left-hand corner, that kind of traditional haute cuisine, is becoming Americanized, that's strong for me. I don't know that I would, I don't know that I say that in any of the stuff that I've written about this, even though the, it is a tendency. But what, what makes it Americanized um, um, is certainly that there's a reliance on economic logic, for sure. There's an, an, a, a, a pressure to spend time, in a sense, as a, as a business organizer rather than a, and a, and a chef d'entreprise, not as a chef in the kitchen, for sure. And in that sense, yes, it's become Americanized. But um, there's a really powerful, uh, in a sense, def set of defenses against that also that keep it hidden, that keep it concealed, um, that when I first kind of, when I first made this connection, it was as kind of trying to organize materials, and this was literally in the ho in a hotel room. Um, I think I told you about it at one point. I was supposed to meet with Pierre Bourdieu to talk about the progress of this in the early stages, and I realized I had no idea where I was going to go with this in relation to that. And I just took a piece of paper and just started drawing this kind of thing because I was terrified about that he would think I hadn't thought this through, and. He said, yeah, that's exactly what you ought to do. Now write it up. This was in 1996 or something, you know? I had no data on that up in the top left, and nothing. I, this was all just speculation. But it was a speculation um, that when I began to sort of probe it, no one really knew um, about, even in France. And I know that that sounds, I don't think of myself as any kind of Paul Revere or something, but I, I, wrote, I, I, I wrote that outline for Le Monde Diplomatique in 2001, and when the editors read it, they thought it was a really great piece. They had never thought of this stuff before. And I'm thinking, you haven't thought of it, you're immersed in, and that was the thing. That's what it was. They were so immersed in, in this, as most French people are, that you don't sort of think about it. You have your chefs, you, you know, it's, I guess it's if you're a sports fanatic, you know? You're immersed in that world, and it's logic, and it's, who thinks about the kind of hidden, I mean, increasingly there's a discourse about the economics of sports, of course, but we don't want to be spoiled by it. We don't want to have it destroyed for us, you know, so we keep, and I think that that's also how one, the, the, the French kind of national kind of patrimony was maintained as a kind of, you know, this is very French, we know it's very French, we have great pride in it, the state invests huge amounts of money investing in, you know, where, I mean, where else does a, a, would a state um, hire these chefs to go into local elementary schools, take tours of the country constantly, teaching young people um, the meaning of, 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 uh, of the artisanal production process and food and its aesthetic? I mean, it's quite a remarkable kind of infrastructure that's, that's put in place. So there's a lot sort of to dissuade people from wanting to consider that those institutions that they find loathsome um, are implicated in this process. And that's why, um, yes, that's been Americanized, but there are limits. There are, you know, um, if, if they, meaning they, meaning the, the chefs up there and the institutions represented in that upper left, if they show their links to this too clearly, I, the whole ed ed edifice will collapse, I think. Um, it will lose its distinctiveness. It will lose its aesthetic place in the French uh, cultural imagination and, and its power, you know? So I'm not sure if that gets at anything, you know, what you said, but, you know, yes, sir. I 
keep thinking about <coughs> whether there is another example like this in terms of the gastronomy. I keep thinking about Japan. Uh, Japan has kind of like the left, upper left corner. Yes. Uh, uh, around a lot of their chef and their food, nationalism and so on. Mm -hmm. And my impression, my hypothesis based on no data <coughs> is that there is much less penetration between mm -hmm. these two corners. And the upper left corner in Japan is more resistant or almost immune to this penetration from the industrial sector. And, mm -hmm. and I keep thinking about why that might be the case. Uh, um, there could be many reasons. One thing I keep thinking about is that, you know, whether there is certain institutional logic in that upper left corner of the field in France that made it more vulnerable uh, to the penetration from the, you know, things like the three Michelin star is a very... Which story? The, 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 the three Michelin star, the, oh, the yes, yes. and then yes. how they rate yes. the chef and how you... It keeps uh, it locked you know, in. And it, it's a very standardized system that's very easy to be converted to other fields. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and you know, I read this story about how resistant Japanese chefs were when Michelin star Michelin actually tried to publish you know, guide. Their, their, their guide in France, and many uh, famous chefs actually refused uh, the star that you know, they're going to. So I, I wonder whether there's a good internal question, yeah. institutional right. logic that yes. is different in Japan. From the France. only thing I, I think of when you say that, it's just an immediate reaction, is that French haute cuisine kind of has a pretension to universalism uh, that I'm not sure, um, like the American pretension to universalism in the realm of economics, right? Um, in the cultural terms, the French have this kind of idea that it's kind of a mission, right? I'm not sure if the Japanese I have that. that. Japan actually is actually the opposite of that almost. It's you know, an it's in, 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 insularity. Culture, it's insularity. They never think mm -hmm. that it's uh -huh. universal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's yeah. Hi, Mars. This is going to be a great book, right? Uh, but I was I was thinking about the the Michelin star uh, economy, if you will, system system mm -hmm. of well the kinds of credits that are there symbolically, and it seems to me that part and I don't know where this comes in your story chronologically, mm -hmm. but that part of what's going on with the Michelin star is as Cheyun was also mentioning vis-a-vis -vis Japan, is it's become not just a system for ranking French restaurants. It's become a global system. And that, that global system could also be seen in, in certain ways, not so much as you know, the Americanization of, of Michelin, but the Frenchification, Frank if you yes, will, sure. of yes. the... That's a good point. I think that, in fact, I, I remember just reading about when that was first beginning, when they were first kind of, it's only fairly recently that they began producing these guides for other countries. Yeah. And I remember the discourse about that in a few magazine articles and um, that it was troubling to some people, yeah. you know? Um, but that that's how it was sort of won out on the basis of, you know, we are known for our excellence in this cultural domain. We should spread it throughout the world and you know, spread our standard. Partly because of the power of this, that the French, that is, the power, the French were feeling the power and pressure um, of this, and so saw so this as something needed to be promoted uh, in a comparable way. You know, the Americans can sell us their, their fast food and their hamburgers, uh, we should be able to sell excellence in taste uh, to the world. And I think that that's part of the movement that allowed them to open up to a, 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 an American Michelin guide and a um, a German, a German uh, now, I guess, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of them. Yes. But, but it's also, I mean, I, related to that, even beyond the Michelin itself and, the, and their ranking yes. systems, um, is the, for example, uh, the Alice Waters Chez Panisse, not coincidentally a French name for yes. a sure. quality restaurant to reaffirm a different yes. style That's right. of cooking, right? Yes. A new uh, style, but also traditional, the grand chef America, the grand American chefs, and now we have those yes. in the last ten years. You know, the last twenty years. Before that, you had no sense of an American cuisine. You now, we now do, but they must. You know, they make their pilgrimage to Paris, right? They all go spend some time working in a, often in a French kitchen, 
Um, there's, maybe that's now starting to change a bit with Chez Panisse and a few institutions. But for the, for the most part, you had to make your way through France to become a great chef in the U.S. Um, and it's, you know, this is what, I don't know, isn't it? It's what cultural hegemony is, right, well, it seems okay. to me. Yeah, right? It's but, establishing one's position in a cultural domain internationally, beyond your borders, where you have significant resources invested. Um, right, but right? I, that's, the, that's the real question about, yeah. or to me that was one of the very interesting ideas behind this, is not just the kind of globalization and the Americanization or neoliberalization right. of that process in France, but right. the, the Frenchification or the yep. spread of a kind of ranking, rating, yep. And a discourse of something that separates itself clearly from simply importing the French. All right, right. the Julia Child import the French. Right. It's quite different than the Alice Waters Chez Panisse. That's right. Which reproduces, and it, which reproduces, and uses in it. local That's terms, right. Right. a different kind of local idiom right. for artisan. And, and to take the right. artisan and the local out of the context of it has to be a French artisan and a French local. Right. Right. And universalize yes. that, mm -hmm. but the, there's a very real tension between that kind of symbolic capital and and capital capital. Economic, that, right? Yeah, but you know, um, yes, you're absolutely right, and and that's part of the narrative. That will be part of the narrative. Um, the thing is, it's not as though all fields are equal, right? Gastronomy as a, as a kind of cultural field, one of many cultural fields, in a sense, withers in the face of economic, the economic field. The economic field dominates everywhere. And it's not as though um, there are economic domains that are pushing back hard against the logic of French cultural uh, hegemony. <laughs> That's not happening. It's going the other direction. That is, cultural fields are vulnerable to economic dominance, and therefore the United States has its place, um, has a field open to itself in economic terms that the French don't have in their domination over cultural goods, I would argue. That is, fields are hierarchized. Uh, you know, that changes over time. Uh, you're right, the religious field had much more power a thousand years ago than it does now, but the point is that, uh, uh, the econ uh, that cultural fields in general um, are being battered, no matter where they are. Um, even though, having said that, your point that French, in a sense, domination within this domain is being spread consciously is absolutely also true. And it reframes the process in, even in the United States. And is being sought yes. actively from the yes. outside. It was interesting, when I first started this whole project, you know, I was looking at the origins of fast food in the United States. And uh, restaurants in the US used to be in the 1950s, I don't remember, I was too young, but I was not, you know, there were no, before there were fast food restaurants, basically there were uh, uh, restaurants, American restaurants that sold seafood and chops, right? They were, and, and then suddenly continental cuisine appeared in the 1950s. Continental cuisine, in a sense, coterminous with the rise of fast food in the U.S. Why? Because American middle class people wanted to distance themselves from this m mass process and develop a kind of more cultivated taste. And also American capital in general was becoming more international, right? Our sites were more international than they had been. So, um, so, so there's that process in the US. In France, at around the same time, you could get hamburgers at the drugstore on the Champs Elysees really expensive hamburgers because it was a kind of a taste, a little taste of Americanism. Um, uh, and when, so when fast food begins to develop in France, it's very um, sophisticated people. People who've traveled, businessmen who've been to the United States want to show their place, young people who have a more kind of global orientation. I looked at, when I looked at the, the marketing studies, um, very few working class people going to McDonald's. It was all urban, uh, uh, white collar workers, not all, largely white collar workers and largely young people. Um, uh, it's very interesting, the, market, the markets were in a sense reversed. In the United States, one develops a kind of haute cuisine to distinguish oneself from the masses. In France, that same cuisine, in a sense, represents 
a sense of distinction right, at a certain point. I think that's now changed in France. I think it's uh, becoming more diffuse now. It's, but for the first 20 years of its existence, I think 